the kingdom, as I said, as far as Jesus is concerned, is not only for a selected group, even though sometimes it can be very, very tempting, even for the one who is proclaiming the kingdom to remain. Later, when Jesus sends his disciples out on mission, Mark 6, 7 to 13, he will warn them about this, that it is likely that you can get comfortable in a particular ministry. You got to be careful about that, that the ministry does not become the end in itself. The kingdom is always the end. And that's to answer the question which was asked earlier on about the immediacy. Mark then summarizes here, close to the end of the first chapter, there is another incident after this. But in Mark 139, Mark summarizes what Jesus has been doing so far. And what you notice is that Mark is very, very clear about the fact that the ministry of Jesus, the work of Jesus, or the approach of Jesus is not merely preaching, proclamation, teaching. No, it is also healing. Now this, brothers and sisters, is something which we need to keep understanding in our own approach as disciples of Jesus or as servants of the Lord. Namely, that our response must never be only word. Sometimes it is true that word heals and helps, and it may be enough sometimes. But at most times, in my opinion, word must be backed up by action. In James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, James Chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, James writes there about how we must practice our faith. If our faith is such, which only tells people, yes, be well, be warm, be filled, be full, it is a faith, James says, which is necros. Necros means a faith which is dead. A faith which is alive has to show itself in works. As I said, works may not always be required, but are required most times. And that is why Mark, when summarizing the ministry of Jesus, uses both words and action. If you were to ask me to choose a miracle, which I would place above many other miracles, it would be this, the healing of a leper. You will notice that I have highlighted some words in order to explain what they mean. This word leper could refer to any kind of skin ailment. Today, the scientific or medical term for leprosy is what is known as Hansen's disease. We only use the term lepers for those who are infected and affected by Hansen's disease. However, at the time of Jesus, leprosy or the term leper could be used for anyone with an external skin ailment. It could be psoriasis, for example, which is an external skin ailment. It could be leukoderma, for example, which is an external skin ailment, which can be seen on the outside. Leukoderma and psoriasis all have their root within, but they can be seen and witnessed outside. So you can see that a person's skin is infected. Now, therefore, leprosy was not merely Hansen's disease, which eats into the digits, for example, which eats into the fingers and the toes and other parts of the body, not only Hansen's disease, but any other kind of skin ailment. Why? Because Judaism was a religion that was very external. The external practice 
practice of Judaism was as important as the internal practice. So if a person with a skin ailment, if a person with something affecting the skin came to the temple, came to the synagogue to worship, it was not really looking good. It was not seeming good externally. That is why lepers had to be relegated, had to be pushed to the margin. The leper was treated as an outcast. When the leper came into the city and only allowed to come into the city to beg for food, they would have to ring a bell in order to warn people that they were approaching and shout, unclean, unclean. If a person was suffering merely from a skin ailment, and was treated in this manner of even if a person was suffering from Hansen's disease and was treated in this manner, you can imagine the psychological effect on the person. That I am not even allowed to let my shadow fall on someone, I will pollute them. I will make them unclean if my shadow falls on them. So you can imagine the state. This leper came begging and kneeling. You notice? The kneeling is an indication of great entreaty. And even though Jesus, the RSV, the new RSV, have chosen pity, I prefer to use the term anger, moved with anger or gistasis. Why has the new RSV chosen pity instead of anger? Because pity is a term which is seen in most manuscripts and the best manuscripts. So they have chosen the word pity. However, I think that Jesus was moved not so much with pity, which can be a reading. He would have surely been moved with pity. But more importantly, and I will tell you why later, Jesus was moved with anger when he saw the leper. And notice Jesus R on top and at the bottom Jesus T both where the text uses he. he. The pronoun he is used. The new RSV has changed it to Jesus. Notice the fact that Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. In my opinion, the pity of Jesus the love of Jesus, the concern of Jesus is shown there. But the anger of Jesus is shown, we shall see later, in the way in which the leper is treated. Later, the word leprosy, again, they will tell you, it refers to any kind of skin ailment, not simply Hansen's disease. And the leper is warned, the command to silence here, is given to a person. We saw in 134, the command to silence was given to demons. Here, it is given to a person. The rabbis, and by the way, this miracle is found, we can see in Matthew and also in Luke. The rabbis regarded leprosy as incurable by any human being. Lepers are cured only twice in the Old Testament. One is where Miriam, the sister of Moses, is cured. And the other is Elisha cures Naaman the Syrian. These are two miracles, if you like. But notice, Elisha does not go and touch Naaman. He is far away from Naaman. Naaman stays far from him. And it is God's message which Elisha gives Naaman. And it is God who works the healing of Miriam in numbers. So only twice miracles regarding leprosy cured have been recorded. This leper comes begging and kneeling. Now this, for me, is a sign of great entreaty. But more than that, more than that, it gives us an insight into the disposition of the leper. It gives us an insight 
into the frame of mind and the heart of the leper. I will use these same words later when we come to Mark 14, 32 to 42. But for now, enough to say, it gives us an insight into the leper's frame of mind and frame of heart. So even before his prayers, and then his prayer confirms his begging and kneeling, confirms the disposition of his mind and heart, the content of his prayer, what he prays. Notice, an excellent prayer. And really, if only we could hear to pray like this, and especially in these times. Notice what the leper says. If you will. First. I am letting my will. Be at the service of your will. My will has got nothing to do here. Not what I want. No, I don't want it. If you will. And second. If you will. Also express that Jesus is capable, that Jesus is able, that Jesus is competent, if you will, if you can, but only if you will. Notice, so there are two points to be read in this phrase, if you will. First, and I say first because for me, looking at the leper's disposition, this would be first, if it is your will, I am willing to to let my will be subsumed by your will. I'm willing to let my will be at the service of your will. So if you will. And second, if you will, expresses that Jesus is capable. If you want to, it's easy for you. You know, you can do it. So if it is your will, you can make me clean. So notice, you can make me clean follows if you will. So what I want, cleanness, I want to be healed, is at the service of your will. Now imagine if all of us were to pray like this. Often during these days, I get an email or a message from someone saying, Father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my cousin, a relative, has been seen to be positive. Can you pray for the healing? Even though I don't say to them in these words, I'm telling you that my prayer is this. Lord, you know what is best for this person. If it is your will, send the healing. If it is not your will, then do what is your will. And this I learn from the leper and from the Lord himself. Because usually our prayer is, give me, give me, give me. This is what I want. And it's okay to do that. It's okay to do that. And you can, as a matter of fact, in Mark 14, 32 to 42, Jesus does that first. But he doesn't forget to do what the leper here does first. If it is your will. So what is important is that we should use this technique in our prayer. And the first is the disposition. That I am confident in my external disposition. So the leper, the external disposition of begging and kneeling expresses this confidence. And then he is willing to cede his will to the will of God. Because technically, the ability to make clean should apply only to God. So while the leper is not telling Jesus that Jesus is God, what the leper possibly seems to be saying is that Jesus has the power. That he recognizes that it is in Jesus that God's power will flow. Matthew and Luke avoid showing often, often, not always, but avoid showing often any emotion on the part of Jesus. 
Mark, as I said, uses splanistasis, that means from the depths of his being, which really the word compassion, we use it so often, pity, but no, right from the inner core of his being, he felt this feeling. That is what Mark. However, I believe, I think, that the more difficult reading is orgistasis, wound with anger. Why anger? Jesus is not angry at the leper. As a matter of fact, the leper behaves like a thorough gentleman. He doesn't come close. He's away. He kneels. He begs. He makes sure his shadow doesn't even fall on Jesus. So the leper does everything perfectly. So Jesus cannot be angry with the leper. Then why is Jesus angry? Because many cannot explain the anger. They say, no, let's choose the less difficult reading. Pity. He can be moved with pity. Yes, it is true. That to be moved with pity can also mean that Jesus reached out his hand in compassion and touched the leper saying, don't worry. However, orgistasis is anger against the institution. Anger against that religion which has determined that a person with an external skin ailment must be treated as an outcast, must be treated as away from society for no fault of the person. That is the anger. So the anger is against the institution, is against the manner in which this person is treated. He is not treated as a human being. And we shall see why, for me again, anger seems to be the reading later on, on the instructions which Jesus gives him. So Jesus shows that the leper, and this is why anger, he's not angry with the leper, otherwise he would not reach out and touch him. Even Elisha, when he cures Naaman, never touches Naaman. But Jesus is much greater than Elisha and Elijah combined. And so he reaches and touches the man. So on the surface level, he's violating the restraint, but his anger prompts him to do that. Not so much his pity. You could interpret that his pity would also have prompted him to touch the leper, but more his anger. Let us see what anybody can say to me. And Jesus knew that the leper would be healed. And so in a word, be cleansed, catharsis. You heard the English word catharsis, a cleansing. And be cleansed indicates that God is the one who will do the cleansing. So Jesus also is at the service of God. And we notice here, for the first time, a human being is given a command to silence. And the reason why I said anger is because this demand, show yourself to the priest. Because, for, as a testimony to them. And while this phrase can be seen in the positive, show yourself because the law, Leviticus demanded that a person who was cured from this external skin ailment had to be confirmed, had to get a certificate that the person was cured or the person was clean from priest. So it could be in the positive sense, yes, I am cured now. But more importantly, it could be in the negative sense. And this is the sense I prefer. Show them that their laws are really not laws of God. Show them, be a witness to them of the fact that they have treated you in this manner and ought not to have treated you in this manner. So the command to silence is first given to a human being and in this case it is a leper. The next scene is where Jesus returns. Now notice Mark is specifying not simply Galilee, but villages or places within Galilee. So he returns now to Capernaum. In the first eight chapters, he is in and around Galilee. He returns now to Capernaum. 
Again, notice the crowds. What we notice here, importantly, about the healing of the paralytic who is let down from the roof, we notice a number of points. First, it is what I call a pronouncement story. In a pronouncement story, there may be a miracle, there may not be a miracle. There are basically three kinds of stories which have been identified in the synoptic gospels, three kinds of narratives. One is a miracle story, which we saw earlier, and a miracle story, basically, the case is narrated, the cure is effected, and a confirmation of the cure is given. So case, cure, confirmation. A pronouncement story is the second kind of story. And the third kind of story is what is called historical stories or legends, like the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, the clearing of the temple, and so on. Those are called historical stories. The pronouncement story, which I would believe Mark 2, 1 to 12 is, may contain a miracle or may not contain a miracle. This is a pronouncement story which contains a miracle. However, in a pronouncement story, the pronouncement which Jesus makes, and here he makes it in Mark chapter 2, verse 10, is the most important part in the story. So in a pronouncement story which contains a miracle, the miracle takes second place to the pronouncement. There are pronouncement stories in which there are no miracles. We shall see them later. But now, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, the healing of a paralytic is a pronouncement story which also contains a healing or a miracle. If you go through the text, you will see why I am saying that it is a pronouncement story because after reading Mark chapter 2, verse 5a, which reads, and he said to the paralytic, you can go to verse chapter 2, verse 11, which says, rise, take up your pallet and walk. So if I read my text from Mark chapter 2, verse 5a, which says, and Jesus said to the paralytic, and then go to 2.11, rise, take up your mat and walk, it becomes a miracle story. There is no pronouncement. There is no controversy. However, if I stop at 5a and continue from 5b to 10a, then it becomes a pronouncement story. So in this particular structure, there is what is termed as the introduction and there is the conclusion. The first is what we may term as a spiritual healing. The second is the physical healing. And in between is the pronouncement or the controversy. So this is a five-part structure to see the healing of the paralytic, which we term as a pronouncement story. And so first, when they are sitting down there in the, the paralytic is let down from the roof. What is important is this. There are times in our lives when we are faced with obstacles or hurdles or challenges. Now, these obstacles or hurdles or challenges or difficulties can be seen as impediments, can be seen as blocks in our way of moving forward. However, we can see them as opportunities. Let me give you a small insight which I had a few days ago. I am giving the Gospel of Mark or an introduction to the Gospel of Mark to two groups. That is you, the seminarians of St. Pius X and to the seminarians of J.D.B. Pune. At the same time, I am here in Bandra. You are either in the seminary 
you are in a parish, you are in your home, you are in some other place. At least four locations. 25 of you. The JDB seminarians, and I have two classes with them at 11 o'clock and 12 o'clock. They are in Tamil Nadu, they are in Kerala, they are in Andhra, they are in other parts of India, they are even abroad in Ethiopia, in Nairobi, in Kenya, and other places. Would that be possible? Look at the opportunity. Look at this opportunity. That so many, 118 seminarians of JDB and 25 of you here are getting the course which would never have been possible. Supposing we were able to travel freely, I would have been in Pune. I would have been in Pune for a total of three weeks to give this course. Now, in the same three weeks, I'm giving the course to you and I'm giving the course to JDB and I'm here without spending a single Naya Paisi on travel, without wasting energy on travel, without getting tired and perspiring and so on. Imagine. So look at this as an opportunity. So what do the friends of the paralytic do? They could have come to the door and they see this huge crowd at the door and they say, it's not possible, my friend. I'm so sorry, but we'll take you back home. We brought you here thinking it would be possible for us to get entry, but we can't. It's too big a crowd. So what are they going to do? They will have to take you back home. However, whether the suggestion came to the friends from the paralytic, whether they decided on their own, that is not told to us. But we are told that they do not give up. In Luke chapter 19, verses 1 to 10, we read the story of the encounter of Zacchaeus with Jesus. And even as Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus, there are two impediments. And those two impediments are first, that Zacchaeus is short. And combined with that, is that there is a crowd. So his short stature and the crowd prevent Zacchaeus from seeing Jesus. Just like here, here it is a crowd which prevents the people from bringing the paralytic in. Zacchaeus also could have said, I am going to give up. I can't see him. I'm short. I'm not going to become tall all of a sudden. The crowd is going to remain. So let me give up. Let me give it. I will not see him. It's okay. Doesn't matter. But Zacchaeus doesn't do that. Zacchaeus is creative. Zacchaeus is original. And the desire in the heart of Zacchaeus to see the Lord is so genuine, is so real, that he does two things. He uses this impediment or obstacle or difficulty. He uses them as an opportunity to think. And what does he do? He runs and he climbs the tree. So notice, he becomes tall. In that one glance, he becomes tall, so he is original, he is creative. And he's also reasonable, logical. He doesn't simply run to the ends of the earth and wait in another place. No, he runs and climbs the tree, so he becomes tall. So that means he's there before Jesus can come and he's also tall now. The crowd is no longer an impediment. The crowd will no longer upset him. The crowd will no longer be an obstacle. Now, the sycamore tree is the opportunity. So the friends of the paralytic do not push their way. Do not barrage into the home. There is too big a crowd. They may have wanted to do that, but it's such a huge crowd. They just cannot move. Also, it is likely that the man may have been paralyzed for some time. We do not know. So in a way, while it restricts a person tremendously, it is not so much a matter of life and death. And yet for these 
friends, it is a matter of life and death. And they will not give up. They will not give it. They will look at these obstacles. They will look at these impediments. They will look at these difficulties as an opportunity. And what do they do? They climb the roof. They take the man up. And they let him down. What a creative way. What an original way. I would like to believe, even though the text does not explicitly say, because the text says, seeing their Now, the pronoun there could mean the faith of the friends who let the paralytic down. It could mean the faith of the friends and the paralytic. We're not told. But simply, Jesus saw surely there is a pronoun which is plural. So their faith will surely mean and include the friends. It could also include the paralytic because he let himself be let down. Seeing their faith. I would like to believe that Jesus was not only taken up with their faith, he was also taken up with their originality. The text doesn't say it. That is what is called eisegesis, reading into the text. We should not do that when we are talking scripture. But in a way, when you're doing your own meditation for yourself, when you're doing a spiritual meditation, then you can attribute these intentions there or these feelings there in Jesus. He looks up. He says, my God, what creativity, what originality. How wonderful for them to do this. And for a friend. Notice that's another point. They did not, we do not know whether he paid them, he could pay them, but mention their friends. So it's likely they would do it for no compensation, whatever. And they use that creativity because there is no tomorrow. There is no tomorrow. There is no later. There is no after. There is only now. And this today is used by Jesus in Luke. Today, Semeron is a very, very important word for Luke. He uses it more than any other evangelist. Luke uses today Semeron twice in Luke 19, 1 to 10. Zacchaeus, come down. I must stay in your house today. There is no tomorrow for the Lord. And later, this man also, salvation has come to the house today. Salvation has come today. Later, he will tell the, the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. The angel gives the message to the shepherds, today is born for you a savior. Today. So today is an important word for Luke. Mark's friends also will not have a tomorrow. We will let our friend down today. And so Jesus is so inspired that he begins to forgive the man's sins. And for the first time, and this is something which I would like you to study, this phrase or term, son of man. And the question would be, son of man, in the gospel of Mark, how would you study, if I asked you, study this term, son of man, in the gospel of Mark? What you would do is this. First, you would take a dictionary or another. You would take a concordance. A concordance is a book which tells you how many times this term is used and where it is used. So it will tell you, if you go through a concordance, that this term is used in Mark, it's used in Matthew, it's used in John, it's used in Luke, it's used in other places, it's used in Ezekiel, it's used in Daniel, it will give you all the places where it is used, and it will tell you, it is used 14 times in Mark. And it will give you the references. So the first job will be to say, where is it used? How many times is it used in Mark? First of all, how many times in the Bible? More or less, how many times in the Old Testament? How many times in the New Testament? How many times in Mark? You'll get an idea when you see the New Testament. Matthew uses it less times than Mark. Luke uses it less times than Mark. Mark uses it 14 times. So it seems to be an important term for Mark. 
the first thing you do, even without going to any, don't go to a commentary at all. There's no need to go to a commentary. So the concordance, that is a book, original study book, concordance. Then, once you've done this thorough homework, and the concordance itself, even without going to the text, the concordance itself will give you so much of information which you can make your notes on. Then, you go to a dictionary, the theological dictionary of the New Testament, TDNT. TDNT by Kittel is a very, very renowned book and is the standard dictionary which you must go through. TDNT, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. So when you go to the dictionary, it will give you the term son of man and the meaning. The meaning and not simply a general meaning because son of man is used in so many contexts. It will give you the meaning of in how Ezekiel used son of man. What did Ezekiel mean by son of man? What did Daniel mean by son of man? What did Mark mean by son of man? It will give you an explanation. Once you go through these two books, from what you have studied, you make your notes. So I'm giving you a hint now. I'm telling you the phrase son of man is used in the beginning, the first half of Mark's gospel only twice, 2.10 and 2.28. Later, it occurs 12 times. And in most of those times, it occurs in the context of the passion and resurrection uh, predictions and in the coming of the Son of Man on the clouds. So basically, you can say that Mark uses Son of Man in three contexts. First, the Son of Man on earth, Mark 2.10, Mark 2.28. Second, the Son of Man who will suffer and die, 8.31, 9.9, and 10.33. And Mark uses the Son of Man coming down on the clouds of heaven to gather all to himself. So this is very briefly a study of the Son of Man. Only here in the Gospels are we told that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. Now, the scribes kept murmuring, why does this man forgive sin? How can he forgive sin? He's blaspheming. And blasphemy was punishable by death. If a person claimed to be God or to usurp God's power, that person could be stoned to death. Now, Jesus issues a challenge to them. And the challenge with Jesus issues is seen, and most of us might think that it would be easier. So the question is, is it easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise, take up your mat and walk? Now, you and I might say it is more difficult to say rise, take up your mat and walk. And I say no. It is more difficult to say your sins are forgiven because when you say your sins are forgiven, you can be accused of usurping God's power. You can be accused of blasphemy and you can be stoned to death. But if you were to say rise, take up your mat and walk and the man did not rise, did not take up his mat and did not walk, then you would be accused as a charlatan. This is a fake man. He's a fake miracle worker. That's all. You will not be stoned. You would say, be careful. He's the man who tells lies. He's a fake man. But the first, it was more difficult to say, rise, your sins are forgiven. Because if you said it, you could be accused of blasphemy, which Jesus is in this context. So, the physical raising of the man is only shown to prove that the first part is true. So it's only a show because we can see the man taken. And that's why Jesus says, I say to you, get up. And the man obeys, notice, and he got up. Take up your pallet. Immediately we are told, immediately again, immediately he took up his pallet and go to your house and went out in front of them all. So this physical healing is given as a proof, if you like, of the fact that Jesus could heal and forgive sins spiritually.